SpaceX has upended the rocket industry, as you know, and managed to become one of the most valuable private companies in the process. It tops CNBC's just released Disruptor 50 list. Morgan Brennan got a rare and exclusive look inside the company, sat down with a woman who's helping to carry out Elon Musk's vision, and joins us this morning from SpaceX headquarters in California. Hi again, Morgan. Hi, Carl. Good to see you. So this is a company that Gwen Shotwell, COO and president of SpaceX, says is now valued at about $28 billion. Now, I sat down with her for an exclusive interview uh, inside this building behind me. This is SpaceX's rocket factory. It was a rare interview. It covered everything from SpaceX's ambitious plans for human space travel to the business model that is enabling this company to carry out the vision. Is SpaceX profitable? We are profitable. We've had many years, actually, of profitability. Uh, the, time, the years that are financially rough for us are the years where we have issues. So issues like the explosion on the launch pad in September 2016. Correct. So okay. that made 2016 a tough year, 2015 as well. And in light of that, I mean, part of the reason that SpaceX is on number one on the CNBC disruptors list. You've had an incredible past year of major milestones. You've broken a lot of records, but also it has been that fast turnaround after that explosion back in 2016. How were you able to do that so quickly? That was actually a really hard problem to unwind, the issue that we suffered on September 1st, 2016. It actually gave the teams time, the production teams time to catch up, actually. Uh, it's kind of a horrifying way of uh, catching up on production to basically not be flying because of that issue. But but it did give us time to catch up and also gave us time on the engineering side to continue designing the upgrades, resulting in the last launch that we had, the Block 5, first Block 5 launch for Banga Bandu. I want to talk about one of your emerging revenue streams uh, that's a little more near term, the satellites. You recently won FCC approval for a constellation of thousands of broadband satellites. How does that help fund some of these longer term plans? The market size for launches is dramatically less than telecommunications. Uh, um, so that's a nice way to go uh, and get to make additional revenue. In addition, it's very complementary uh, to the work that we're doing right now. Dragon is a very sophisticated satellite, uh, and we have our own launch capabilities. So I think we'll be able to, assuming we get the physics right, uh, as well as the business, right? I, I think we'll be able to emplace a constellation uh, that could be quite successful. Adam Jonas at Morgan Stanley argues that the broadband capability could be used for Tesla. It could be used for Tesla. Just like Tesla battery technology, I believe we've leveraged for Falcon 9 and Dragon as well. So yeah, the companies are not, uh, we're not joined, uh, but we do share technologies and capabilities wherever we can. In fact, I think the Boring Company could be the way that we house people on Mars. We'll have to dig tunnels for folks. Really? I think so. Makes sense. One of the other things that's been brought up by some analysts is this idea that maybe the technology is being shared on manufacturing floors as well, that there's cross-pollination. Is there? I think we've learned from Tesla uh, on manufacturing. Yes, they produce far more units than we do. Um, we will produce about 14 first stages this year and roughly 30 second stages. Tesla is producing thousands of cars a week. So there's a lot we could learn from Tesla for sure. So of course, given the fact that there does seem to be some cross-pollination and all of these different companies are led by Elon Musk, what is it like to work for Elon Musk? You know, there's been a lot of that in the press uh, recently. I love working for Elon. He's, uh, he's a great boss. He's funny. He's incredibly fair, almost to a fault. Um, and uh, he works really hard. He's an inspirational leader, inspirational boss, and you, I want to work hard to make sure I do whatever it is I can do to help him. How much time does he spend with you conquering space and mapping out some of these targets and these technologies? He spends roughly half time uh, on SpaceX and roughly half time on Tesla, and that varies depending on what's happening in either company. You've done nine rocket launches this year so far. You've got another one scheduled for this week. How should we think about that launch cadence going through the rest of the year and beyond? So for the rest of this year, we're flying at least a few times a month. I think it, overall we'll fly between 24 and 28 times this year. Uh, next year will actually be a slight slowdown. Uh, the market has decreased a little bit. So next year you won't see as many launches as you see in 2018, probably roughly on the same order as 2017. Why is it slowing down next year? 
The geotelecommunications industry has flown between 18 and 24 satellites a year. Last year, very few satellites were ordered in 2017. That makes 2017 or 2019, two years later, a lower uh, a lower cadence year because buyers of launch tend to buy about 24 months or two years in advance. Now, longer term, both you and Elon have expressed this vision to see rocket launches that are as regular as airliner flights. When does that happen? So, obviously, the market has to grow a bit. Uh, we launched 18 times last year, served the market. As I said, this year we'll launch just under 30, serving the market. And we're doing probably 60% of the launches 60% um, of the launches across the globe. So in order to launch every day, you have to have a lot more launches. And I think once we're flying people, uh, that could actually be realized. So guys, uh, we spoke about that. We also sp spoke about the new BFR, short for a big effing rocket that is under development by SpaceX and which will be the rocket that is expected to start carrying humans to Mars. Shotwell saying that they're still on track for that process to begin happening in 2024. In the meantime, in this factory behind me, I did tour the production line. SpaceX says it has the capability to produce one rocket engine per day and two of its workhorse Falcon 9 rockets uh, per month. Specifically, the newest, most powerful version of Falcon 9 known as Block 5. I think with the time I spent with Shotwell, uh, both in sitting down and touring uh, the manufacturing process, one of the things she really stressed was that it is not just about the innovation of the products themselves, the design of the products themselves, but that this is also a company that is innovating on the manufacturing line and adopting new processes, and all of that goes towards the cost cutting that SpaceX has become so famous for as it has made space once again very ex exciting to the world. Uh, Morgan, I, I get the reusable rockets part. All this talk about Mars, I don't know about you. I don't want to go to Mars. I like it here. I'm not sure you're the target audience. I mean, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, who is well, this, the broadband satellites, though, very interesting. And Shotwell seemed to be talking about the size of the market for that. Is that what we should expect that all of these potential launches that, that, that SpaceX is going to be able to do in a potentially more cost effective way? That sort of thing is going to be their be, uh, bread and butter? Uh, I think the satellites are a very big part of, and remember, the satellite business and specifically the emerging broadband satellite biz business overall that a number of companies are looking to get, get into is expected to be a very high margin business for a company like SpaceX that could be another revenue stream that helps fund development of its BFR rockets to start doing these missions to Mars. It certainly sees it as a big opportunity. Um, in terms of going to Mars, I'm kind of with you. I'm on the fence with that one, even though I want to go to space. I actually asked Shotwell if she wants to go to Mars, and she said she wasn't so sure she wanted to either. But she did say that there's probably about 10% of the population out there that have expressed interest so far in going and being on the forefront of colonizing that planet, that there is, in fact, demand out there. Uh, and that is part of the reason they're, you know, building this new hardware and moving yeah. forward on this. Yeah, 10 percent. Uh, that sounds high, but maybe we the thing, hear about the layover. Yeah, it's quite a long flight. The, the thing that struck me, Morgan, was, um, you know, Musk has taken pains to say he's sleeping at the factory floor trying to get these bottlenecks done over at uh, for the three. And yet here she's saying that he spends half his time at SpaceX. Yeah, it, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, those comments and that part of the interview was very interesting. Um, uh, I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the case 50-50 right now uh, based on what she said. But the fact that in general, overall, that is how he is managing both of these companies, very enlightening. There's been some of that speculation in the past, but we haven't heard quite that much detail about what the management structures look like. Uh, an amazing Until and now. obviously very, very rare look at SpaceX, Morgan. Uh, we owe our thanks to you for that. Uh, our Morgan Brennan at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. A lot more to come. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.